about NKA. NKA or New Knowledge Adventures. NKA was brought to the Treasure Valley in 2015, and it was modeled after a very successful lifelong learning program in the Pocatello area. We are so thankful for all of our volunteers, including our instructors, our Zoom hosts and facilitators, and all who volunteer for our NKA committees to help our organization run more smoothly. A few ground rules or housekeeping items first. Participants can leave the class at any time and you'll do that by looking in, at least on my computer, the lower part of your screen and you'll see a red um, leave button. If you click on that, you'll be able to leave the session. Microphones will be muted during the class, but if you would like to ask a question, you'll use the chat by going to the bottom of your screen again with your cursor, click on the chat uh, word bubble, and you can type in your question. We'll take periodic breaks to uh, ask any questions that have been posed at that point. All right. This session is going to be recorded. So if you would like to watch this session again at a later time, or any of the NKA classes that have been recorded, you'll do that by going to YouTube and typing NKA Idaho in the search box. <clears throat> All right, we have two instructors for our class today. First, we have Sandy Perky, and Sandy is a five-year advanced master gardener with the University of Idaho Extension Office. Sandy has taught classes for NKA before, and she enjoys passing along her love of gardening to others. Mm. Our other instructor is Marie Bonamino. Marie is a very active volunteer with NKA. She enjoys cooking all kinds of food. Now, being of Italian Sicilian heritage, she likes sharing her love of Italian flavors, and she'll be sharing a wonderful pesto recipe with us. And just a reminder, when you got your email reminder for today's class, there it was in red print, uh, something that said, a link that said, click here for uh, the pesto recipe. So be sure to do that so that you can access this delicious recipe. All right. I believe that is it. So Sandy, let's okay. get started. Okay, terrific. All right. Let's see, do you need to switch me over as a presenter? I can see you on my computer, hopefully everyone else can. Yeah. Can you see me as a, as a presenter? Yes, yes oh, we can okay. see you. If everybody has their um, screen on, uh, no, the screen on the gallery, not the gallery view, but the speaker view. As long as you all have speaker view, you should have Sandy. Okay, great. Okay, terrific. Hello, everybody. It's great to meet you. Uh, thank you very much, Murray. I wanted to talk to you today about basil, uh, one of the best herbs, hands down. Absolutely love this herb. And we can grow it very easily here in Treasure Valley. Now, the types that we grow here are very basic types. Um, I have grown some of the more exotic ones. I'll tell you, they didn't do as well as the ones I'm going to show you today. The Sweet Genovese, which I think Marie will be using later. This is a fantastic basil. It grows so well here. It's wonderful. Another one that I enjoy very much is the Thai basil. It's got a little bit more of a peppery taste to it. As you can see, the leaves are much tinier as compared to the, the Genovese. And the stems are very, very floppy, shall we say. Um, with these, I usually put them in the area of a tomato planter so that it, it kind of encourages them to grow upright instead of doing what they're doing right now. This one is my pride and joy. Uh, by the way, I bought these three plants over at North End Organic because mine were not nearly this large yet. This is a lemon basil. Lemon basil is very, very good for all kinds of things. One thing I use it for is compound butter, which is a very, very useful for all basil types. It, it works beautifully. 
But what I use it for in the summer is for a, a very refreshing beverage. And that is, I take the leaves, I put them in the glass, I crush them with a spoon, I pour in half of, uh, I squeeze about a half a lemon. I add in ice cubes and sparkling water, stir it up. It is amazing as a refreshing drink. So just a clue there what to do with lemon basil. Now I started some of my plants and I stagger mine so that they grow at different times of the year. So I almost always have fresh basil, which is fantastic. So this little guy right here is four weeks old. <laughs> He's tiny. As you can see from his soil, I use perlite in my potting mix for basil because the roots are so, so small and very, very tender. You have to have a nice, loose, crumbly soil for them to get through. Now, if we're lucky and they grow up beautifully, they look like this little graduating class and they are eight weeks old. Um, they're about ready to be transplanted into a larger pot. And they are already with their true leaves. The true leaves are the first set of leaves that come up other than the first two that uh, the plant puts on growth first. So they're almost ready. So what do we want in our, our basil planting mix? We want good crumbly soil. We want it to have a nice rich uh, compost blend in it. I usually use a potting soil or a seedling soil when I'm starting seeds. These guys that I did, these little guys were started from seeds. So I always use those. Um, I tend to go more towards the organic because I, I use these all the time. I eat them constantly in salads and all that. So I don't want any, any preservatives or bugs or anything with them. Uh, when you go to plant your basil, you want to plant it in a sunny location because it loves sun. But as you can imagine, these leaves are very, very tender and they can scorch very, very easily. So what I do is I put mine in the garden. I have it right outside my garden room where it's got a little overhang to it. So it gets the morning sun for about six hours. And then in the afternoon, it gets a little shaded area, but it still gets a little bit of sun. So you want it to have six to eight hours of, of sunshine every day. It loves the sun. One thing it does not love is wet feet. So you don't want to drown it. You want to water it from the bottom, never from the top, because the top will leave the leaves very, very spotted and also susceptible to um, to bugs and you don't want that. Some of the bugs that are loving basil are aphids, which we all know about here in the Treasure Valley. Aphids are crazy busy in this, in this area. Another thing we get here, and I've noticed this so much last year, I, I don't know if anyone else noticed it, but I started getting slugs and I've never had them before. So I, I went and got myself this, this product. It's called Sluggo Plus. And it's, it's a granular form that you just sprinkle around the base of your plants. And then the slugs won't go over it because it kills them. So I use that for, for that purpose. Another thing I do that is um, very organic is I collect all of my eggshells all through the winter. And I do a lot of baking in the winter. So I have a lot of eggs <laughs> and I collect them all. I put them in a big Ziploc bag. I roll them with my rolling pin until they're a fine, sharp dust. And I put that around the base of all my plants. So when I put these guys in, the, the uh, eggshell is going to go all the way around the base. What that does is it's very sharp and slugs go over that, they're gonna cut themselves and they're gonna learn right away that that's not a hospitable environment for them. So we try to, to discourage them from coming into the garden by using that. Um, let's see what else I need to tell you about basil. You want to fertilize it every two to three weeks after it's in the soil and after it is well started. So 
when I put this guy in the soil, which I will not do until the first week in June because the weather is just too crazy right now and it's got to be warmer soil for basil to grow. When I put this in the soil, I will fertilize it every uh, two to three weeks. I tend to go more towards the three weeks because I don't like to fertilize them so much that I, it, it just seems like it, it, it bothers them more than it helps them. So I try to do it every three weeks. Now with basil, if you've grown it before, you know that it puts up these beautiful stalks of purple flowers and they're gorgeous and the bees absolutely go crazy. I let the bees go crazy for about a week. <laughs> then I go out at dusk and I clip those stalks off because once it's got stalks that are producing flowers, it has stopped putting its energy into making the leaves, which you definitely want with basil. So I go out in the evening and I cut down those stalks and it upsets the bees a little bit, but I let them have it for at least a couple of weeks. So <laughs> they've had their time to get their nectar on there. Also, since I plant these at different times of the year, um, I stagger them about every two weeks, I'll put in new plants because I use a lot of basil and I always want to have it with me. So, um, you know, if you fertilize them every, every three weeks with a liquid fertilizer, you're gonna use like a 555 balance blend and water it down well. Don't, don't throw it on there straight because it, it'll burn your, your uh, roots and it will not work correctly. But it's, it's fabulous to have. I mean, it does make them grow. You just want to make sure that the growth is going into the leaf and not the flower. So let's see else. We talked about pests. And, oh, I wanted to talk to you about how to harvest your basil. Because a lot of people look at it and they go, oh, well, this part's really pretty. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to start moving down here and taking these and let these continue to grow. And that would be the big mistake, which I have learned the hard way. Because if you take these lower leaves right here, you're taking the shade away from the stem of your plant. So you always want to harvest from the top. Let's see if I can get this really close. Okay, right there. So if I was going to harvest basil from this plant right now, I would snip it at this point right here because as soon as you snip that from the top, two more branches are gonna grow out of it and you're gonna get more and more basil. But you wanna be sure to keep the bottom shaded. You don't want it to be uh, open to the sunshine because it'll, it'll fry the plant and then, then your leaves won't do anything. Um, some of the uses for, for basil. I'm sure Marie is going to go over the, the best one, which is, is pesto. Um, I use pesto in a lot of things. Basil, I use in almost everything. <laughs> um, I use it in grilled cheese sandwiches. If you've ever taken basil leaves, just snipped it off, put it in with your grilled cheese sandwich and grill it. It's phenomenal, just phenomenal. It's so, so good. Another thing I do with basil, and I don't, I don't discourage my other plants either. I put in sage, I put in basil, I put in rosemary, oregano, marjoram, thyme. I make bouquets and I keep them in the kitchen in a vase because they smell so good. It's really invigorating for your kitchen to have these incredible smells. And, you know, you can always just snip the herbs right there if you feel like it, or you just let them let them continue to uh, make your house smell amazing. It is one of the best herbs there are. Um, I think we talked earlier about um, what I do with the lemon basil. And I do use it for compound butter, which you could do with any of the basils or any of the herbs for that matter. You can use any herb and make it into a compound butter. Compound butter is simply a butter mixture. You take your butter, you soften it up, you put in your chopped herbs, put in, I put in um, some uh, of my lemon peel. So I've got a little bit of that in there. I put in a little bit of lemon juice 
and I put in probably far too much Parmesan for my health. And I just form that in little pats, little butter pats. Now I use those on steamed vegetables. I use them on, geez, anything, fish, chicken, um, beef is incredible with beef and pork. And of course I can use it on my pasta. You know, you're, you're running around, it's 5.30, you have nothing out for dinner. If you have these little butter pats, you just melt those and toss them in with your pasta and you're all set. Unless of course you have the pesto, which Maria is gonna show you how to make. That is the best key of all for the use of basil. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, there are several questions. I oh. think you might have already answered the first one. Um, one per, uh, Catherine asked, when should I plant basil seeds outside in my garden bed? Okay, um, outside is, it. you should plant your seeds outside in uh, about May 10th, if you're gonna do seeds. Now, if you're doing a plant like I just showed you, then you're going to be doing your plants around June, June 10th or so. Um, you know, basil is, is very, very tender, as I said. And it's, it's just crazy weather right now. So you're really going to have to look for how the weather is at this point. We have, we have beautiful weather outside right now, but it is so windy and you don't want the leaves smashing around. So it's very important to, uh, to protect them at some point. If you already have them in the yard and you know we're having one of our famous little windstorms, I would cover those with a frost cloth or you know, I've used blankets before, um, tarps, whatever you could do just to make sure that they don't get beaten up by the wind. Okay, and dovetailing, this is a question from me, dovetailing off of, and then we have some others after this, dovetailing okay. off of Catherine's question, I plant my basil in uh, small planters on my patio. Uh, yes. it, the timing would be about the same beginning of June, mm -hmm. depending on the weather. Right. Okay. Right. Yes. All right. And, and I'm really glad. Um, I now know why my basil leaves get scorched <laughs> and to go ahead and pinch off those flowers. So thank you. Right. All right. Some more questions. Uh, Gypsy wants to know, Sandy, do we need to bake our eggshells? Because she has read to bake at 250 degrees for 15 minutes to destroy any bacteria. And she, Gypsy, has been saving her eggshells this winter also. Fantastic, Gypsy. Great job. I have never baked my eggshells. What I do is I wash them out with warm soapy water, just like a dish. I use them just like a dish. And then I let them dry on my drain board with paper towels. And once they're completely, completely dry, I put them in that Ziploc bag to be mowed down with the, the rolling pen. Okay. And I believe this question is also from Gypsy. She has some basil that went to seed at the end of last summer, brought it inside, but she did not get enough water on it and it dried up with the indoor heat. Do you think she can plant the seed? Yes. If she has seeds from the flowers, you could definitely plant those seeds. That's another thing that I forgot to mention to y'all is the flowers that you cut off when you're annoying the bees and cutting off their, their little pollen source, save those flowers because when they dry out, they have basil leaves in them. And you can reuse those leaves next year. Sorry, you can reuse the, the seeds next year. And um, sometimes if you let your basil go to seed and, and we don't have a crazy winter, it can actually regrow. I have had it regrow. Only on the Genovese, only on, on this guy. None of the others I've had regrowth for. And you know, one thing I forgot to tell y'all was how to dehydrate your basil. I don't know if anyone's interested in that, but let me do a quick spiel on it. Is uh, I take my basil, I tried doing it in the microwave. I tried it with the little Pinterest thing I found, but I'll tell you, when basil dries, it gets very light and feathery and I had leaves flying all over my microwave. <laughs> so I said, okay, that's not gonna work for me. I put it in my dehydrator 
it was okay, but it tended to kind of go down through my, my grills in my dehydrator. Um, one thing I found that worked really well for me, I don't know if anyone else has a, a master plan for doing it, I'd love to hear it. I use the oven and I turn it on 200 degrees. I wash my basil leaves very carefully, take the stems off of them, dry them completely. I put them on a cookie sheet like this. By the way, if you have a nasty cookie sheet in your, in your kitchen with rust on it and you just say, oh, this is so ugly, I can't bake another batch of cookies on it, put it in your greenhouse. It is fantastic. It holds your plants. You have a water reservoir here. With seedlings, you wanna water them from the bottom anyway, so it's perfect. So if you see some at the garage sales, pick them up, put them, put them in your, your gardening area. They stack really well, they're perfect for this. Now back to drying. I put them on the cookie sheet. I put them in a 200 oven for about 25 minutes. I turn off the oven, I go to bed. I get up the next morning, they're dry. And I take them very carefully and I move them into a Ziploc bag where I crush them up. And that's how I save my basil. If anyone else has ideas on how they've done it successfully, I'd love to hear it. And we have one last question and it's uh, actually, it's a wonderful segue into the second half of the class. And Marie asked the question, what a coincidence, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Marie wants to know how long does basil last after picked and do you need to freeze after you pick it when you're not making it into basil see that nice segue mm, or pesto okay. sorry <laughs> okay there is a handy dandy little thing that my sister got me for Christmas which is an herb keeper and actually if I was to take off this whole stem Say I wanted to, to harvest this entire little section here because it's, it's several little plants here. There's like four of them right here. If I wanted to do all that, I would put these in something called an herb keeper that holds it. It looks like a butter keeper, but it's about yay big. I'm sure she got it at Amazon. That's, that's where she spends all her money. It holds a reservoir of about an inch and a half of water where the stems go through this little grate, if you will. And it keeps the herbs really, really beautiful. I've done it with thyme, I've done it with sage. Um, oh, my oregano worked beautifully for that, and basil. And it'll keep them for about, I would say, probably about two weeks. And just keep it in the fridge. And it works really, really well. All right. I, I believe that is the end of questions for Sandy right now. And Sandy, okay. I, I thank you because I'm going to have a much better basil crop than I have in past years. Yay. I'm so all glad. Right, Marie, Marie, we've all eaten lunch, but you're going to make us hungry oh. again by making that delicious pesto. So Marie, all take right. it away. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm in my kitchen, so I'm going to walk around to the side where I have everything set up and we'll start the process. So thank you, Sandy, for all the information on growing basil. So now you go, what are we going to do with basil? So many things for you to do. Today, I'm going to show you about pesto. So I'm hoping you received this recipe. Or if you haven't, it should have been sent to you and you can print it off after the fact. But this is a pretty simple recipe. I've taken this out of a out of the uh, pasta making uh, book that I have. And so this is something that you can follow this recipe or if you have a different recipe, that's fine too. I just thought I would at least share this one with you. So I have the basil sitting here that I've washed at this point, it's clean. And I have um, the basil that's called Genovese, just like Sandy gave that uh, name to us. And it has a wonderful smell when you are picking it, when it's growing, and then also when you start to chop it. Now there's probably the easier way is you could use a Cousinart, um, which that probably would do it much quicker. 
but I'm chopping it first right here on my board. So I'm going to do some of this or I can do all of this. I put it into one of these mortar dishes and you can purchase these and you'll use it for several things. If you're a guacamole eater, <laughs> you would love having this or there's probably many things that you can use it for. And I, I picked this one up. There's, they sell them everywhere if you'd like something like this. And then after you've cut your uh, basil all up, you can put that into the dish. And if you'll look at the recipe, it says you need three cloves of garlic and you crush that up, um, a, half a, a half a cup of pine nuts. And pine nuts, you have to kind of search them out. I mean, sometimes they're just not in the nut section. You, you might have to just go to the baking section, or maybe you might go to where at one time, not so quite often now, you would go to where all the natural foods were and you could just purchase them. They're pretty expensive in the sense that they don't grow all the time and they only grow certain places. So they're kind of like gold. <laughs> so don't throw any away. If you can, don't right. use them all, put them in your freezer. They last. So I have the pine nuts. I have olive oil sitting out, which we're gonna use. And I like to use both Romano and Parmesan. So I buy both. And I buy my own, and then I also grate it myself. So I grate it right when I'm getting ready to make my, um, whether I'm putting it on sauce, whether I'm putting it into the, um, I guess you want to say any sauces. And this is, we're making it with the pesto. So I put about half of each. And I know everyone might buy it already grated, but I don't know. I just, Maybe it's because I'm Italian and I watched this my whole life. You just grate it and it's just fresher. And then all of a sudden you got the smells going on too. So just to let you know, I have put some pasta in the water, which is over on the um, stove right now. So we are going to put this onto some ziti pasta when I get done creating this. So you'll put your cheese and your olive oil, it calls for, I think it's three, two or three tablespoons of olive oil. So I'm gonna add that, I put mm -hmm. three. And then you can chop your own garlic, which I have sitting here, or you can cheat, no problem with yeah. that, and buy it already chopped up inside of hey, the little box. I love that. So whatever makes it easy for you, do that. And I think that's all we're gonna to need to get it going. Mm -hmm. I've got the garlic, the basil, the cheese, the olive oil, and of course, a little salt and pepper. So I'm going to cheat use this right now. And you can use more or less of any of these items that I'm telling, telling you about. And just start the crushing it up. Wow. So that's this, what we're gonna, make up here. Oh, cool. So the smells are coming. That's for oh, sure. Look at that. And when you make this, and that's why I'd ask uh, Sandy about how long you would keep this, but if you're not going to be using it all, you can put it into a container. You know, you can put it into a small container like this or this, how much you make. You can stick it in your refrigerator. It does stay in good shape for quite a while. You've probably seen that a lot of places sell it in the store. And I'm sure they say once you open it, you would put it in the refrigerator. So yes, I would do that too. One thing that I learned from it, um, someone years back is, honey, I'd, I'd go over to visit this older gentleman and he'd make pesto and he would take these little pieces of saran wrap and he put the pesto in it and this is the way he would save it he would take the, the pesto put it in this little wrap it up like this and he would put them 
into an ice cube tray and he just put them in the freezer. And so whenever I went to visit, he'd go, just take some pesto home with you. And then I'd just go in his freezer and I'd take two or three of these home. And there you go. Then I'd have it for the evening or for whatever meal I was going to make it. So just another way to tell you how to maybe you can save little bits. You know, I don't know if you have a family or if there's one or two of you and you don't need a lot at a time, you can always save it like this. So let me check the water over here. Oh, no. There you guys still cook. These are, even though I have my timer on, these take a little, this takes a little bit longer. So I'm gonna keep making a little more pesto. For your entertainment here, we're gonna have a, my little bear is gonna sing for you. She helps me out in the kitchen here. <laughs> person who's filming us and he likes to cook too so we do make it a social event that whatever it is we're trying to put together we're kind of doing it as a team but Marie as, uh, Carol had mentioned and it's also on the sheet you can use pesto for so many things you can add it to soups you can put it on, on a some type of salad. I mean, there's rice dishes or couscous dishes. A lot of different things that pesto is um, going to be one of the uh, highlights, let's just say, especially if you've told people you've made it yourself and it's homemade. So you've got a homemade dish going on. So I think you can see just about how much I've made here which for what we're going to be putting it on this uh, pasta right now, I think we've probably got plenty. But like I said, if I make too much, then I can always save it for another time for something else that I'll be cooking. So let me go check the pasta again, see if it's getting to a point where it's cooked. Uh -huh. And Marie, while you're checking the pasta, there are a couple questions. Um, Linda asked if you have already put the pine nuts in the uh, pesto. Here you go. Ah, good timing. Here's my quarter cup of pine nuts. All right, so you add the pine nuts. Do you add them typically to toward the end? You know, I think it's just whatever. Um, you know, I don't think it really tells you to do on the recipe. Maybe it does state when. So put the basil, garlic, pine nuts all together, grated cheese in the food processor. Or if you pound it by hand, I think it wouldn't make a difference. It just all right. And then there's an interesting comment from uh, Lisa. Lisa uses nutritional yeast in place of Parmesan cheese for a vegan option when she oh, makes pesto. Well. That's a great idea. Yeah. And then Gypsy said lemon zest would be a great addition also. Absolutely. I would actually think about putting maybe even lemon zest on the top of the dish, which we could do. See how that kind of kicks up the flavor. And, you know, whether you like a lot of cheese or a little cheese, you can go with whatever, you know, taste it along the way, see if it meets your taste buds. I don't like to use a lot of salt, but I do put a little, you know, and I salt the water in, you know, for pasta. So I tend to say everything has, 
should only have a little. And if most chefs, you see, they don't put much. That's not um, a must by any means, but you do need some salt and pepper, just a little. So, you know what? Because I should taste this just to be sure. Oh. That's Italian, that's Italian. Okay. We're gonna take this off, pasta off here. <laughs> so we can get to the next step. And I'm gonna drain this. I like to put a little oil on it just to make it get a little um, to where it'll, you know, the uh, pesto will cling to it a little more. I have my dish sitting here ready. So I'm going to go ahead and put the pasta on the plate and then just put the pesto on top of it. <laughs> we'll bring it over here. You know, I happened to see some red pesto the other day, which was very interesting. They use sun-dried tomatoes in their uh, pesto. So that would, that's also something that might get, if you want to get a little more creative, they had uh, sun-dried tomatoes along with all the ingredients that I just put into this. Whoops. You know, and you can put as much or as little of any of this that you'd like. And if you're a person who likes it to be lighter, you would probably use maybe as much as I just did. If you'd like it to be coated a lot more, I think you could add a little more to it for flavor. I always tend to put a little, um, bit of oil on top and a little bit more cheese on top just because that's what I like. So that's a thought. Just putting all of that. Since Gypsy mentioned that lemon zest for curiosity, I think I have some lemon in here. I do. <laughs> so I'm just going to do that to see how, see what that might do. Probably take it up a different notch. There you go with a little lemon on it. That might change it a little bit. And then I would probably put a little pepper on top. You know, funny, it's an inexpensive dish. You know, it doesn't cost much to make if you have all these ingredients, but I bet if you're in a restaurant, you're still going to pay 10 or $12 for a dish of this when really it, it didn't cost that much for me to create this in my kitchen at home. And um, I feel like it's something that you could say it's homemade. It is homemade. You didn't make the pasta, but everything else is homemade. So that's it. All right. I'm hungry, even though I ate lunch. <laughs> um, and there, there are a couple of comments. Uh, Lisa says that she has used Thai basil, radish leaves, and other greens such as spinach. 
And she also uses walnuts for a less expensive nut. All right. Uh, Jerry adds cherry tomatoes and pepperoni to make it a meal. There you go. Yeah. That's and then a let great me scroll idea. back up in the chat box because Sandy has gotten us the information on the herb keeper that she uh, mentioned earlier in the presentation. Colin Mason herb keeper on Amazon is what she uses when she has herbs in the kitchen. All right, let me scroll down. Um, are there any more questions? So I was going to also remind everybody, um, since this class is, will be posted on the um, NKA Idaho station, you could go back to a class that um, my husband and I did make pasta on a class and you could find that class. Mm -hmm. And then you can make your own homemade pasta and base and do the, the pesto. And you could say, everything's homemade. There you go. Yum. You know, Yum. we can, oh, we can here's, uh, celebrate. Here's another idea. Gypsy is going to try adding cilantro. Oh, see, there you go. You can combine yeah. a little bit of the Spanish-Mexican flair <laughs> along with the Italian flair. And we have some, a little bit of Italian, a little bit of Latin going on. There we go. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. So I would like to thank Sandy and Marie again for um, this great information. I'm excited to have a successful basil crop maybe for the first time ever. And then I've never made pesto before. So I'm really excited about that. Um, before we sign off, uh, we've got a couple of weeks of classes left in, um, for NKA. So let me tell you about what's coming up next week. Did Sandy right. also have some handouts? Can I... uh, not Sandy, you're muted. Sandy, you're muted. But I think you had some handouts on uh, that I thought originally got sent out from Sheena that were about basil. I'm sorry. I, yes, no. it was about basil. Okay. Yeah, I'll send them again just to make sure that everyone has them. And I did update a little bit today as I was going through my presentation. I was like, oh, I forgot to tell them about this. I forgot to tell them about that. Let's talk about dehydration. So I'll update those and I'll send them out. Oh, that would be, that would be great. All right. Well, coming up next week, we have on um, Tuesday from 1 to 2 p.m., build your own charcuterie board and wine pairings, yummers. Um. Then on Wednesday from 10 to 11, that's the 27th, we have digital privacy and security. And that class is gonna to touch on digital privacy as it relates to the use of a computer, mm -hmm. iPhone, iPad, they'll look at identity theft, the internet and social networking. On uh, Thursday, the 28th from 11 to 12, there is a class on making beeswax food storage wraps. That's a very interesting idea. And one more on Thursday from 1 to 2 p.m., a DIY open terrarium class. Mm -hmm. So that's what's coming up next week with NKA. If you look in your chat box at the end of the chat box, I have uh, put in the Cvent address where you can register for any of these classes that are coming up next week or classes that will come up the week um, after that. All right, once again, what a great class, um, such great information. Thank you so much. If there are no more questions, I believe that is it for today. Thank you. Bye, everybody. You, Happy growing. Thank you for being part of uh, the class and continue to keep watching us. And we will have more classes this fall. So we hope everyone continues to join us. Thanks so much. Right. Thank and you. Lots of kudos are being typed in the uh, chat box for Marie and Sandy. So thank oh, you nice. once again. You All right, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.